Hello, uh, welcome to the Fudrinier. My name's Greg Thorpe. I'm a staff writer at the Fudrinier. And for those who don't know, it's an online art magazine that was born out of Paper Gallery in Manchester. And the nature of the gallery kind of dictates the, the work that we cover. And we're interested in artists who are interested in paper. Um, and that can be in any capacity. It can work, be where they start or finish their practice. Actually, it's a super broad remit of, of work. And today, especially, um, we're going international. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to an artist that I've been following for a while and I'm um, fascinated by, and that's Dakota Newt. Hello, Dakota. Hey. Thank you for joining us from, uh, from near Pasadena. Is that right? Yeah. Or just the um, LA, Los Angeles. That's Los easy. Angeles. Los yeah. Angeles which has a very convenient time difference for these kinds of things, actually. So it's worked out very well. Thanks for giving us your time. and. Um, so you're from Dakota and you're called Dakota. Is that, am I missing a clue? Is that- My parents are from North Dakota, but like I was born in Minnesota. It, it's all the same. They didn't think uh, they'd go back to this state, but then they did anyway. Right, well, it's a, it's a beautiful name and um, we've learned something. <laughs> um, so- and It's very repetitive, Dakota from Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Move to where your name fits. Um, so before we delve into a bit of your work, which is like, I mean, it's really, really visually arresting. And I'm uh, on Instagram, I'm a lurker more than a liker. So I take in a lot, um, but I always kind of seek out your work there. <clears throat> and it has such a particular kind of aesthetic that speaks to me in lots of different ways. But just for context, before we start looking at your work, can you tell us a little bit about your, about kind of your life as an artist and your, um, and up to date and also maybe what you've been doing most recently? Uh, um, yeah, a lot of my art's very nerdy too. I think like the, I can't deny like the influence of like fantasy, sci-fi and horror on the work too. Like I really like a pop colorful cartoon aesthetic but I kind of mess with it too, like in a way, like I've been wearing my drawings more lately instead of keeping it like on a frame or on the canvas too, to make it more interactive. Yeah, and do you, um, are you kind of carrying through uh, a, an aesthetic that you've always worked on or have you had any sudden turns with your work? I don't know, it's kind of funny, like I was looking back at my other work and like I've always been drawing or painting animals to an extent like, so it's always been there and it's always been very colorful. Like I never liked like naturalistic color <laughs> palette. Yeah. Um, and so I guess that is the kind of uh, almost like a, a comic book or a childlike input into um, what can be actually quite strange and demonic uh, yeah. in some in some sense. Um, so I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm going to share, um, I'm going to share my screen so that we can uh, look at some of this work. Um, so, can you see that okay there? Yeah, I can see it. Great. Um, everything you can see is recording, that's the rule. Um, <laughs> so, these works are, well, do you want to talk to us a little bit about, this is, this is a collection called Farm to Table, is that correct? Yeah, so, I was doing a series of cutouts as an installation where I used to like, I draw on paper, then mounted it to foam core. So I was trying to think about making it more of a, like a sculpture object, more similar to like a relief where it comes on layers. Yeah. So like these series, like I drew it, then popped it out and like the layers build off of each other. Yeah, I mean, it's really beautifully done and it's kind of uh, like a strange diorama or kind of looking into the window of a really kind of acid fueled house or something. Yeah. And, um, and I think quite, I think that the, the aesthetic that really appeals to me is it's a, it, it's a combination of something quite uh, like infantile and childlike, but it brings with it the potential of like fear of, of those things. Um, and you, you mentioned briefly about doing animals uh, as a, like a long-term commitment in your work, but they're not kind of typical like farmyard themes. I mean, uh, this is this is a piece that I love that's almost like a gangster scenario. Do you, oh, yeah. to, do you want to talk to us a bit about what the animals like are and what the animals do in your work? Oh yeah, so like I'm from North Dakota and most of my family is involved with like farming or connected to it. But like, again, I think when people think of animals, they think of like peas, like 
something more like kind of fun, bright. Like the conservative environment I grew up in is very violent. So I kind of like to mix around with that in like a more surreal dreamlike way. Yeah, and it's part of the um, part of the project, something to do with violence towards animals, or is it about us witnessing what animals really are, which is, you know, just a, a, a part of like the violent cycle of nature like we are? Or even like violence towards like other people too, but then there's more of a reaction because it's an animal, which is interesting. <laughs> like some people would sympathize more with like the animal like getting harmed than the person getting harmed too. Yeah. Especially like in rural yeah. conservative environments. <laughs> yeah, so it's impossible to kind of choose sides almost in this, in th these weird scenarios. But I love that there's such kind of like potent characters and they seem to be engaged in doing something really spectacular or something important but quite often they'll they'll maintain the kind of flat or deadish eye of an animal and so there's this weird disconnect between you know the personification and the the crazy things that they're en engaged with <laughs> you know what i mean and it leaves you they with just let it happen <laughs> Yeah, it leaves you with a really uncanny sort of feeling. So was this collection for a, a gallery show or do you work in series of works naturally? I usually work in series, like I don't consider it like a set for a show right away too. And even this one, it's like I kept getting interrupted with like other project requests. Right. <laughs> That's quite nice, the reason to be interrupted though. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay, I'll do something else for a bit. <laughs> So these are kind of, and, and what scale is this? It's hard to tell. This is the one thing I'm missing from not attending gallery. Oh, so, yeah. yeah oh God, I didn't put the dimensions on this. Like, um, yeah, know. these are small. They're more of like maybe like a 12 by 14. They're okay. fairly intimately sized. Like you have to go up to them. Yeah. And is that, this is like the col kind of colored pencil that, you know, that we might have used as, as children, but you've got a way of like shading and- Oh yeah, I have like one right here. That's, oh, this is a super small one. Oh, I love that. And then yeah, you can see like there's dimension. This is like my first one I did as a practice where like a bunch of pigmen are rich ritualistically like cutting a deer guy. Right. <laughs> and actually the kind of the the kind of cottage sized print scale of them makes you lean in in person, I guess, which is kind of a nice, a nice physical response to them. Um, but in terms of like life size work, which you mentioned, um, I don't know where this kind of sits in your practice, but these are the pieces that I encounter most often, which just, I just adore them, like the fantasy and the, the, um, the, the, like the, the performance element, I guess. So can you talk to us a little bit about these kinds of works? And this is on Dakota's Instagram, which you can find at Dakota Newt. Oh yeah, so I mean, this is probably like really my like favorite thing I'm doing so far too. It's kind of really rejuvenated me like during the lockdown. So like I was experimenting kind of back in the spring when things started, like I had an installation that was just going to be cutouts, but then the show got canceled and I was thinking of like what to do with it. So I'm like, you know what, it'd be kind of fun if I like divided it up and like did looks with it. Yeah. And then it started spinning off where I started getting like better ideas of how to do looks without even making like just like the cutout sculptural setup too. So I'm like, I could become a cartoon character or I could like kind of enact like a lot of like violence and very playfully on my own body. Yeah. So actually um, what, was, what was a dilemma became a new sort of avenue. Um, and that's really exciting and it's really fortunate as well because I know a lot of artists, the opposite of, has happened, but they have really felt their practice kind of withdraw. Um, I think this is like a real exercise in, in the opposite, making a, you know, a new avenue out of the necessity. And I guess also I'm interested in like this, so there's a hybridness going on in your work between kind of people and animals and, you know, that kind of morphing, but also like what is queer about your your work as well would you say and do you, is that a conscious part of what you put in there i think it's a conscious mark i mean i've always been very interested in like the body blending like sex and violence a lot of childlike wonder to it too i know it's interesting like you pointed like the eyes and the expressions like they're always kind of just accepting what's going on or having fun with it but they're not like freaking out or having like a really strong emotion yeah, too. like there's kind of an acceptance of like the body being transformed 
yeah and that, that and that's in that sense it, it that puts us into their world because if they're not alarmed this must be like a thing that they understand it's normal <laughs> yeah it's normal for them and so is it is it the, the kind of the bodily elements to you so like the non-normative um kind of outside of um outside of gender and outside of heterosexuality that makes these works queer for you yeah, I mean, I would, I also have been really like fascinated by not using like, I mean, condition, more traditional like gay male imagery uses a lot of like the dick too. Mm -hmm. I've been fascinated by like queerness that's more of like blurring of like gender or even species and like transforming the body too. Like that's why I give myself a lot of kind of like these breast like forms. But, yeah. Oh, like this one, they're kind of like a fusion between a breast and a testicle yeah. <laughs> and like the shape. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. So in that sense, they could they could potentially be like um, like a, a different kind of human or humanoid. They could be us in the future. Or they could be terrestrial. And actually, I think what's what's most exciting to me about queer art now is that the queerness is around things other than sexuality. It is often about body, not necessarily gender, but certainly bodily. Um, and also, it's it manages to say serious things or pose potentially serious provocations in a really fun and playful way. And I feel like we lost that for a long, a long time. Um, but would you say that there's anything like political about, about what you're doing? I feel like there's kind of a, um, you know, an, in its violence, there's sort of an anti-violence thing. And the, there, is, yeah. there is an invitation to look at animals in a different way. Is, is any of that political for you? I mean, it's interesting because, like, it's political because, like, the environment I come from, like, North Dakota, this rural conservative thing, even though it inspires me, like, I draw from its violence, like, the animal imagery and, like, what I experience, like, it's political in the sense that, like, they would never accept the work. Right. Too. <laughs> you know, even though, like, it draws from them, too, like, I'm inspired by it in a way, like, they would never accept it. So there's a lot of, like, like how they look at like gay queer people too like that gets projected into the word yeah and i think there's always been a strong relationship with like the monstrous and with with queerness and that's so embrace the monster <laughs> yeah. i mean i think the time i think it's the time to embrace the monster because i feel like the affinity with kind of heteronormativity has rewarded so few queer people that it's time to reclaim the monstrous and i love that there's probably a really powerful lineage of work that's been doing that and your work sits in that too. Um, but again, that feeds into your interest in kind of horror and, and um, do you come from kind of like a comic book horror background? Yeah, I love, I love comics as a kid. Also like Clive Barker is such an inspiration too, like the movies, the books, the artwork too that he's made. Yeah. And that certainly would sit into that, um, that family tree of kind of queer artists who reclaimed, you know, the monster and the gothic. And that goes back as far as like early cinema and even earlier in literature. So I love that it reinvents itself in these ways. Um, and so uh, you also are part of a, um, a collective. Um, oops. And I'm just going to see if I can look on there. Um, who, a curatorial collective called Screen Queen. Um, oh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your work kind of as a as a curator there? Oh yeah, so Scream Queen is a, like a project between me and my partner that we started. So a year ago, actually yeah, a year ago in October, we curated a Halloween show. So we were thinking about like horror, but then having by all queer artists, but then also very loose with it too. So like some of them, a lot of them didn't do like a very literal representation of like horror but there was a lot of like recurring like blood, violence, kind of like my work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so in your work, you obviously, you, are, you have other participants and um, are, are they ever performances in, in your mind, the, the display of those works when you're wearing them? I mean, do you go onto the street and do people interact? Is that, is that part of the work now? I've been thinking about it because I briefly tried it when I made this chicken installation a year ago on Hollywood Boulevard. I dressed up as a chicken and then was doing a lot of like chicken movements for the, the duration of it. <laughs> but it was like wetting my feet into it too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but it they were like 
didn't know what to think. <laughs> it takes a certain kind of courage, I guess. And also what I've noticed, having been wearing face coverings a lot recently, is that when people can't see part of your face, it makes you kind of bold in a different way. And I guess that that's where costume, you know, and that performance begin. What's interesting about the scene you wear the work, it, though, is that it, um, it flattens you into the, the dimensions of the work because we, we can't necessarily go behind you. So we might have to witness you as if we would witness a drawing. So it yeah. kind of captures you in that way. But I feel, I feel like it still holds that element of performance because the, the glimpses of the body through it in itself, the contrast can be quite well, unnerving too. Is that like a, um, do you feel kind of like emboldened to, when you're in those costumes? I or? consider them performative too. Like I'm, I'm always considering of like, what am I doing? Like how am I posed or like how people are going to react to it too. Like it's kind of like a film still, but then you're not getting the rest of the movie. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, it's like what might be on the cutting room floor is like a glimpse into some other weirder, bigger world. Um, and actually that's like a nice summary of your work for me is that I feel, um, I feel when an artist has a really powerful style, what you get actually is a bit of a doorway into a, a bigger world, um, a weirder world in your case. Um, and I feel, yeah, I feel like that, that um, your work stands out for that reason, that it, it, its elements are so kind of bold. So I've really valued kind of coming across your work online because I mean, that's more or less where my life is at the minute. And I yeah, feel like same. it's. I, I feel like if we find something that really, you know, pulls us in, we're very lucky. So I just want to say thank you again for your time, Dakota. It's been so nice talking with you. Um, and we will share all of the links to your work uh, underneath the video. And um, I hope you have a lovely day in LA because yours is just beginning. <laughs> thank you. I'll, um, I'll get to drawing. Excellent. Um, and we'll stay tuned to your Instagram. And thanks again for your time and best of luck with everything. Thank you.